And there was this interesting idea that um, Nick Szabo came up with about 25 years ago that was called a smart contract. And he made an analogy to a vending machine, right? So what he said was that a vending machine is a device implemented in physical hardware that basically implements the conditions of some kind of an agreement. And the conditions of, an agree of the agreement here are simple. You put $2 in, water comes out. You do not put $2 in, water does not come out. If you, put, if you do not put $2 in, but water does come out, then that's bad. And the vending machine is basically an encoding of this set of rules and that, that also comes with you know, a mechanism that keeps it at least kind of secure. And secure enough for $2 water bottles. Now, with uh, digital assets, you can think about this kind of concept and, make, and push it much, much further because in the digital world, you know, with, in the world of cryptography, it's this world where even individuals are capable of basically having, to, having cryptographic defenses that are strong enough to even sometimes ward off state-level actors. And when you have that kind of security, the possibilities go up, right? So the general notion of a smart contract is that it's like a computer program that directly controls digital assets. Now, the kind of direct control here is important, right? It's not a computer program that makes a recommendation to a guy about how the guy should control the digital asset. It's a computer program that controls the digital asset. Now, on Ethereum, you can literally send a bunch of Ether into a computer program. And once you've done this, the computer program itself has basically the unilateral ability to control you know, where the money goes. If the computer program sends the money to address A, it goes to address A. If it wants to send it to address B, it goes to address B. And if it doesn't want to send it anywhere at all, then the money just stays there. And you can see this being used in a bunch of applications like insurance, just like any kind of self-executing financial contract. You can reduce counterparty risk in a lot of those kinds of applications by potentially a really huge amount. I mean, you could imagine it being used for even for more complex things. So there is this idea of DAOs, which are like these entire long running entities that hold on to digital assets and bas basically use those digital assets in various ways according to these kind of fairly complex sets of rules. And then you could even imagine, you know, like systems for crowdfunding. So if you think about what Kickstarter does, for example, you know, it's People throw in money. If they've thrown in enough money within 30 days, then the money goes to the developer. And if they, um, they do not send in enough money, then everyone gets refunded. And that's like a set of rules that could be replicated in a piece of code. Now, outside the financial world, there's a lot of possibilities as well. So like the DNS is just one simple and natural one. And you know, there is already a system on Ethereum called ENS, the Ethereum name system. And you know, like this idea of giving human readable names where that are in some ways like not tied to any kind of issuer is also one that just seems very interesting. You could imagine expanding this to identities I and mean, you could you know, take this concept pretty far. So you can replace money, you can replace Wall Street, you can replace core internet protocols. Right. What else can you do? <laughs> uh, in fact, I remember I looked at your About Me page and it has this funny story. I don't know if it's real or not, but you first saw the power of decentral, or at least the demand for decentralized applications when your World of Warcraft character had his rules changed on him by a Blizzard update. Uh, and that annoyed you so much that you had to go out and build something like Ethereum. So in theory, you could even build a massively multiplayer game on top of Ethereum, where oh, everyone yeah. can have the rules verified, right? Well, the story is true, though. The, fa the, the fact that them nerfing Siphon Life and, and leading to me crying, to, crying myself to sleep is what led directly to Ethereum is a bit exaggerated. Okay. <laughs> I do encourage you to check out Vitalik's About Me page. It's, it's a yeah. riot.